Yutomu Nihei is the creator of a manga entitled Blame. It is an often wordless tale that excels at a common feature of fantasy and sci-fi genres. In many ways, its setting is its main character. Nihei had studied architecture, and his protagonist, Kili, is largely silent, often wandering alone, and so the reader is left to evince the story from his surroundings. And they are vast. The author once mentioned that the massive floors of what is only known as the city are connected by massive staircases, taking upwards of 10 days to traverse. A cruel infinity. The structure is impossibly vast. It once existed only on Earth, but grew to incorporate the moon. No one knows how large it is, or why it is. It just is. Endless corridors of concrete and steel, Nihei's city perhaps once grew for a reason. But whatever order it followed in doing so is long lost, and it goes on regardless. So alien is the structure that it's sometimes even hard to know up from down. We learn that the logic with which it builds is even purposely harmful to humans. Expending resources to seek out pockets of survivors eking out an existence on the remnant organic sludge and exterminate them. It offers a fascinating meditation on the fact that the many systems, structures, and technologies we build have a way, through the very logic they encode and our behavior to reproduce them, of getting altogether away from us. Almost as though they come to live a life all their own. This leaves us neither at the forefront of these creations, nor at their teleological end, but stranded, floating, in between. In his book, Subnature, architect David Gisson explores the many unintended consequences of architecture and urban growth. Dust and pollution. Gutter runoff and mud puddles. Insects. And pigeons. One chapter is devoted to debris, which as he opens the chapter, is distinct from other kinds of broken pieces. Shards break from glass. Crumbs from food, <laughs> lint from fabric, but as Gisson points out, prior to the 18th century, French had already two terms for rubble. Moellon refers to quarry stones meant for paving, and décombre for the wreckage of demolition. However, unlike the columns and arches of ancient ruins that we examine as part of a previous whole, debris takes in the total spatial transformation wrought by violence and disaster, and it speaks of the ways that destroyed structures transform their surroundings. One of the most striking examples of this is the famous Greek Parthenon. Sure, it fits in well with its surroundings of age-worn marble striated with wind and time, but its ruin was not the slow decay of history, but a blast from a Venetian mortar shell during the Mauryan War, when the Ottomans had used the temple as an ammunition storage. The sudden occurrence of the word debris alongside the newfound prevalence for gunpowder warfare to shape our environment through violence is not lost on Gisson, who points out that Julian David Leroy, one of the first Europeans to be allowed entry into Ottoman-occupied Greece, related back to his readers the rubble of a battle only eight years prior to his visit. To us, ruins. To him, Debris! 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 Architecture that works to integrate natural features like sunshine, breezes, and greenery are lauded as achievements of design. 
the effort to foreground the peripheral, often denigrated forms of nature offers a recentering of the total consequences of the things we design and the reasons we design them. Gissen defines subnature as forms of nature that become subnatural when they are envisioned as threatening to inhabitants or to the material formations and ideas that constitute architecture. But I think the concept is worth expanding, not just into other features of architecture and design, but into the many unintended consequences of all the structures we create. These structures are political, linguistic, medical, legal, economic, cultural, and so many more. They are a strategy for negotiating one of our species' most intractable metaphysical Gordian knots. The fact that we exist individuated, but must live as part of a whole. That we at once need to stand out and to fit in. That we cannot simply mediate the conflicting desires and differing meanings each individuated subject carries in relating to the group simply by will or telepathy. We are stuck relying on fallible, heuristic designs that aim to channel potentiality into structural continuity. Gissen ends his book by remarking, ultimately, subnature is not about what is natural to architecture. It is about the natures we produce. Between the structures we create lay the unintended consequences we want to ignore or gloss over. But the insistence on foregrounding liminal spaces offers that there is something of value in these marginal experiences and that their existence has lessons to teach us. I mean, there are things just you tend not to notice. They're there. They're so obvious that you just tend not to look at them. shows everything on TV 24 hours a day. The date, the time, video clips of shows. That's just a warning, son. Preview guide. It's not just a good idea. It's the best one. Stop! Wh why Because... the existential horror machine. Uh oh, <laughs> the game. <laughs> There's this clicking game called Universal Paperclips. The premise is simple. Click on the button to make paperclips. And yet there's this foreboding counter in the corner, letting you know how much of the universe remains. Once you build up enough paperclips, the game allows you to build things that build paperclips and things that build things that build paperclips. Then you invest in stocks and dominate the market to expand your paperclip production. But eventually, of course, humans and their silly ways of motivating themselves with abstract stories only gets in the way, and then the option appears to release the hypnodrome to subdue the population. It must be done. Soon enough, you've blanketed celestial bodies in solar panels and mined all their resources. Venturing out into space, you encounter alien life, and it too must die. It's a matter absorbed into the all-consuming paperclip machine, ever advancing towards the next paperclip until every centillion of the universe is converted into paperclips. <laughs> All your base are belong to us. <laughs> You need to get out more. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Let's get out of here.
the game's creator, Frank Lance, based the game off of Nick Bostrom's thought experiment on instrumental convergence. Uh, your most recent game, Universal Paperclips, addresses AI. Yes. And I assume this was inspired by Nick Bostrom's book. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what this thought experiment is about. Like it's about intelligence um, attached to like an absurd or arbitrary or valueless goal. Think of how often our goals are only to attain things for their exchange value, for yet another thing, and in turn, another. Humans being the funny creatures that we are, we have to interrogate our own desires and our motives. We're not always quite clear about what drives us, but machines are designed for a purpose, and pursue it rigorously with the tools and the energy we provide them. What is my purpose? You pass butter. Oh my God. Bostrom combines two theses to arrive at a rather unsettling warning. One, his orthogonality thesis states that instrumental reason could align with any number of final goals. His instrumental convergence thesis says that a sufficiently capable agent will pursue any broad range of intermediary goals in pursuit of its final goal. Like artificial intelligence used to be about putting commands in a box. You would have human programmers that would painstakingly handcraft knowledge items. You build up these expert systems, and they were kind of useful for some purposes, but they were very brittle. They, you couldn't scale them. So the potential for superintelligence kind of lies dormant in matter, much like the power of the atom lies dormant uh, throughout human history, patiently waiting there until 1945. In this century, scientists may learn to awaken the power of artificial intelligence. And I think we might then see an intelligence explosion. As Boston writes, the orthogonality thesis implies that synthetic minds can have utterly non-anthropomorphic goals, goals as bizarre by our lights as sand grain counting or paperclip maximizing. If you create a really powerful optimization process to maximize for objective X, you better make sure that your definition of X incorporates everything you care about. Um, King Midas wishes that everything it touches be turned into gold. This could become practically relevant, not just as a metaphor for greed, but as an illustration of what happens if you create a powerful optimization process and give it a misconceived or poorly specified goal. Victorious, the machines now turned to the vanquished. It's a warning, yes, about Skynet or the Matrix subduing or exterminating a humanity that is long outpaced. But it's also a caution not to anthropomorphize optimization processes. Your flesh is a relic of your vessel. We humans have moral, aesthetic, social, personal, or environmental concerns that keep us from utilizing some of the potentially useful intermediary goals in pursuit of a larger one. But an AI could be altogether indifferent to such motivations. Part of being human is not having our capacities lying orthogonal to our final goal, but embracing all the messy stuff that comes in between. The orthogonality thesis suggests that we cannot blithely assume that a superintelligence will necessarily share any of the final values stereotypically associated with wisdom and intellectual development in humans. Important as this consideration might be for the possibilities of future super-intelligent AI, what I think gets overlooked is that we already have invented this technology. Except we don't call it AI. We call it culture, politics, law, economics. These trigger the unintended consequences I noted in the last section. We rely on codifying behaviors into systemic paradigms. There are, of course, many benefits to this, just as there would be to creating a super-intelligent AI, but there are obvious downsides, one of which is that these systems take over control of our critical thinking and assume trajectories all their own. Embedded within them, we are compelled by their extant disciplinary mechanisms to contribute to the maintenance of the system, even if we don't want to do so. Laws, for instance, can address the reasons for why they are made, but can only operate according to specific inscriptions and authoritative interpretations of these inscriptions. The United States doesn't just run off tax revenue and resource exploitation, it also benefits from a slow IV drip of concentrated human misery. 
Shocking though it is, some states and locales actually enforce legislation aimed at keeping people off the streets during the pandemic. Rates of homelessness were already absurdly high in the world's richest nation, but have only gotten worse with the spread of the virus. And in California, you're not legally allowed to be evicted if you fail to pay rent for the time being. That's what this law was written to address anyway, but the structures of the law, the synthetic mind of the optimization processes we've set up to maintenance this task, does so according to its own logic. Therein, a division grows between the spirit and the letter of the law. Enter this unfortunate couple who spent their life savings on this four-bedroom house in Riverside, California. When Tracy and Miles Albert purchased this beautiful four-bedroom house in Riverside, they never realized that at the end of escrow, the seller would suddenly refuse to give up the keys and leave. That's obviously not what this law was written for, it's just an unintended consequence. And without the force to override it, anyone suffering its effects is just left to kind of deal with it. Went through, broke through six windows. Oh, oh, God. They Man. broke through my front door. They blew off the garage door and they um, used a Humvee to uh, plow down my back fence. They called it shock and awe. Many of the individual structures continue apace, robust as ever, but to the detriment of the whole. I remember this story where the military tried and failed to reject the piles of money that the political system keeps shoveling at them. The purchase of Abram, Abram tanks that you have been somewhat vocal on, that Congress keeps demanding that you buy, that you don't need. And in fact, we're reducing our force structure, so we're going to need less tanks, but yet we're purchasing more tanks that we don't need. For three years, the Army in numerous congressional hearings has pushed a plan that essentially would have suspended tank building and upgrades in the U.S. for the first time since World War II. The Army Chief of Staff even tried to argue that they don't need more tanks, but Congress was like, Shut up and take my money! Despite student loans being a crushing burden and not yielding jobs for the debtors, the market is flush with degrees, and the former education secretary lives a lavish lifestyle with a yacht that unsurprisingly flies the flag of the Cayman Islands to avoid taxes. They say someone untied her family's $40 million yacht and sent it crashing into a dock on Lake Erie. There's something that's really dystopian about this entire prospect of a show where you get your student debt paid off. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Is this where we have come to as Americans. It is. It's the state of higher education. It's the state of student debt right now. The pharmaceutical companies continue to rake it in while America continues to be eviscerated by an opioid crisis. Throughout the pandemic, millions have lost their jobs and health insurance and hundreds of thousands have died while the stock market clocks in historic highs. Record highs across the board. These institutions are supposed to exist for society. But in many ways, it's the other way around. Society exists as a resource for these institutions. The machine has outgrown its creators. We built it for us, but now we work for it. We don't often ponder such things, not least because of the supreme power of any object of cognition the ability to become regarded as normal and thus escape criticism or inquiry. The off-putting, uncanny nature of a lot of liminal art has an extraordinary power to decenter the category of normal and thus return all in its purview to its rightful place under scrutiny. What color are your eyes? What's the color of your hair? What is your gemstone? What is your favorite color? Each color gives special meaning to your life and along with your birthday tells about you and your future. Color psychic Ava Frolish will give you a personalized reading when you call this number. Use your touchtone phone to enter your colors and birth date. Then listen as she reveals incredible things about yourself and your future. Just $1.95 per minute. It's all about your colors and you. Call and listen. Astronaut Bruce McCandless floats precariously in the ultimate liminal space. Distant and untethered, he was the first sentient being to experience this.
Many of the astronauts who've achieved what's known as escape velocity and experienced the supreme and so rare privilege of gazing back on the blue marble have found it difficult not to feel possessed of some otherworldly inspiration. When I was around the moon and I saw the Earth, I realized suddenly how insignificant we all are. When I looked at the Earth on the way back and had time to be a little more contemplative, it uh, underscored and got me thinking, really for the first time, we're just a small piece of an almost infinite universe. What they should have sent was poets because I don't think we captured in its entirety the grandeur of what we had seen. There, on the mote of dust, suspended in a sunbeam. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot. It's as though the unabated Sisyphean treadmill of our lives keeps us too busy and exhausted to engage in communing with this part of our nature. This endeavor of dedicated reflection ought to occupy more of our lives, but there's practical work to be done, and so far, that has meant disciplining the population into a sustained project of repetitive, organized production. The existential questions of our being relegated to expertise, or, more often, to the margins. Liminality began as an anthropological concept to describe the states of being between rites of passage. When they climb on a tower, they have no fear because it's their country. But it's enjoyed a new life on the internet, where instances of liminal spaces instead conjure feelings of eeriness, offness, the uncanny, dreamlike incongruity or the just plain weird. For me, there are three aspects of this kind of liminality that ring loudest. Our relation to space and structure. Our relation to time and nostalgia. And our fleeting visitations with moments of intensity. But all three coalesce around the same notion. We cannot apperceive meaning without dividing it. A line, like in the case of borders between territories, makes the territories what they are by demarcating them. Difference abounds, but the only way to make sense of it is through a seeming paradox. A category can designate, but only by reference to its content, which can only be referred to by words, concepts, symbols, and other things that categorize into categorical distinctions, which only make sense given reference to their content, and so on and so on ad infinitum. Part of the human experience is being able to handle this ephemerality. One way we do this is by endeavoring to make concrete touchstones of continuity, to give form to the ever-fluid experience of reality. Another way is by reconciling becoming okay with the fact that our certainties are like shoals or rocky outcroppings on an otherwise infinite swim upstream, and that no distinction will be the final word. And yet, even this humble, deeply human endeavor is something our great structures can weaponize against us. Around the 70s and 80s, the field of human geography was beginning to form a lot of the theoretical underpinnings it has today. Some of the most central figures in this were David Harvey, John Agnew, Yi Fu Tuan, and Alan Pred. But I was raised in a situation where there was very little theoretical apparatus for this. It was a more sort of just ad hoc, empirical kind of discipline. And I think one of the ambitions I 
gained at a very early age was to try and give some sort of theoretical basis to it, some sort of theoretical centre to what seemed to me to be a really fascinating uh, empirical set of issues. Spaces are mere coordinates, but for something to become a place, it also needs a sense of place, a way people feel about and interact with it. As Pred writes, this means that a place is dependent on participating individuals who are not regarded, in one instance, solely as producers, in another as residents, in another as members of an age or racial group, in another as consumers, in yet another as perceivers of the environment, and so on. Instead, process participants are regarded as integrated human beings, who are objects and subjects at once. But it's the decentering of these human participants in defining and shaping their places that has come to mark the increasing liquefaction of our world. One of sociologist Sigmund Bauman's most lasting contributions has been his concept of liquid modernity. Rather than the solid, often strict traditions of the past that operate outside critique but that also provided roots to their members, modern society is underscored by being liquid, ever shape-shifting and requiring the same of us, of our love, our fears, our lives. So we are already afraid. Precariat lives by anxiety, by fear. A big part of this for Bauman was the way we relate to space. He draws on the two methods that Levi Strauss had noted that societies have for dealing with the otherness of the other, either through the anthropoemic, or man vomiting, or anthropophagic, man eating. The form of the stranger can be sped out, incarcerated, deported, killed, or managed into urban ghettos, precarious employment, or selectively designed spatial usage, i.e. protest zones. We are referring it as the free speech zone. But the stranger can also be devoured, metabolized, to become identical with and no longer distinguishable from the ingesting body. See conquest, forced conversions, the banning of dialects, languages, calendars, and religious and cultural practices. To the design of the city, Bauman casts shopping malls and other temples of commerce that unite us across differences through forming us into consumers as an example of the phagic response. The dystopic trends of hostile architecture that aims to assuage behavior through design might be a good example of the emic strategy. We incorporated some angular rock in the design feature just to make it less attractive of a place to, to uh, hang out. But perhaps the most evocative example is Myanmar's new capital of Naypyidaw. In 2005, the government relocated the capital to this bizarre, sterile, and removed non-place of a city. It's odd, breathtakingly so. If you ever have a chance, well, well, can't say I'd recommend going there, but it is hyper-liminal in a way. In here is like overgrown and derelict and like not being used at all. Already this place is just... Look at this! A waste, basically. Nobody's here! Nobody's living in any of these. There's literally people living in shacks and starving. And then there's this. Bauman blames our lack of ways to successfully interact with one another and the failure to forward a project of building that capacity as the reasons that urban design has taken to such measures. He adds to these the non-places of anthropologist Marc Auger. We've all seen non-places before, often they're transitory spaces, a road, an airport baggage claim, a parking lot, even a grocery store for its visitors. They're places we pass through, places we're meant to use and leave. To be merely physically at, not socially. Not in any way that would make them places. During the Arab Spring uprisings, the movements gathered steam in public squares. Tahir Square in Egypt, most famously. But I remember the response to protests in Bahrain was to bulldoze what was not even so much a public square as much as a roundabout. 
but it still allowed for political gathering and had to be, as the government said, cleansed. Indeed, cleansed of its placeness. It's fine and likely inevitable to have non-places. The problem is that non-places have taken up so much of the space that should be accorded to actual places. Places could look like this. But in North America especially, they often look like this. You've likely seen this photo on the internet before, or something like it. Where is it? Well, somewhere, sure, but that's not the point. The point is it could be anywhere in America. Which is due to a lot of things, sure. America's car obsession, R1 zoning, ugh. The single-family home neighborhood has always been the sacred cow of, of zoning. But whatever the reason for any specific area, the non-places they create abound, and we're forced to live with their effects. Bauman quotes, but frustratingly for me and uncharacteristically for him, does not cite Michel Desertot, remarking, Never before in the history of the world have non-places occupied so much space. And that's just the problem. With liminal spaces, spaces in between places, being so much of the overall space, there are fewer and fewer actual places. There's another kind of non-place I hadn't considered until semi-recently. I was fortunate enough to grow up in this cookie-cutter home to a warm and loving family. Mom loves me better than you. <laughs> uh, okay, well, mostly loving anyway. And now that I've been away for so long, it's so weird to think about how everyone in this neighborhood owns their yards and that they pay for them and are responsible for their upkeep, but also kind of don't. I mean, you're not allowed by law or convention or the threat of angry neighbors worried about their property value to do whatever you want to your own front yard. According to this study, the American lawn is by far the most irrigated crop in America, three times larger than any other. Not to mention their upkeep is a needless strain on the environment and our respiratory health. And let's not even get into the pit of inhuman despair that are HOAs. Board members are using a selfie stick like this one to peer into their patios to take pictures of violations. It's just weird that the entire front of a privately owned home is so regulated and has to remain this bizarre display piece. Like a weirdly performative facade. I know it's bizarre to think of these images. Fitting in with these. But to me, these images seem like some of the most liminal I've ever seen. Like, what are these here for? Why would anyone design this? But there's also the other consideration, that instead of these neighborhoods acting as tight-knit communities that foster generations of closely bonded people sharing and contributing to these places throughout their lives, there's sort of no boundaries. You live here, I live here. It's just kind of oh, wow. They are more so products that people bought, investments to fret over. People don't give a shit about sustainability. They want big beige boxes. Being able to appreciate these images of shuttered blockbuster stores or a local man enjoying his meal in unrenovated Taco Bell is being able to see the value and the very transitory nature of the surroundings that a lot of the people doing the appreciating grew up in. For me, it's the smell of PlayStation CD cases that's most liminal in this sense. There was perhaps no greater comfort to knowing that it was Friday, my brothers and I were going to the video store to get a movie, and mom was gonna let us stay up late playing a rented game and eating junk food. Heaven. But there's also a way in which we all kind of know that never should have been. The YouTube channel Echo Gecko recently published a video on the suburban impact on childhood. And among the research he cited was this study, concluding that many children in developed countries now primarily experience their neighborhood through their car window. Even if you live nearby to where you need to go, 
The built environment is so hostile that parents considered it unacceptable for children to walk. Rather evocatively, this study he presents contrasts the maps children drew of their routes to school between those driven and those who walked. The difference in detail is perhaps unsurprising, but the sheer alienation from the clearly walkable distance with which these children grew up is rather stark. All the more so when you consider the lasting impact of one's environment during such formative years of cognitive growth. The paper actually includes the kid's actual route to school, and even though the kid is literally just driven around the block, they don't even get the turns right. Echo Gecko's in-depth series on the suburban wasteland is a must-watch, and it highlights the rather grim melding of Levi Strauss's previously mentioned modes for dealing with otherness. It's at once phagic and endemic, devouring and exiling. In this X-Files episode from 1999, the characters struggle to awaken from hallucinations within hallucinations as they're put into an inception-like illusion by a giant fungal spore that is slowly digesting them alive. As Scully remarks, while she's trying to will herself out of the secretion-induced coma, There are plenty of interesting hot takes on the slow cancellation of the future. Cool art to appreciate that lends meaning to what we're often supposed to just disregard. A huge supply of reading to be done that helps contextualize our world along with YouTube videos, podcasts, video games, movies, all kinds of stuff. I certainly love it. I really dig the retro aesthetic. But it's worth considering how even access to some of the most enlightening information has a function of making us complacent for the structure to metabolize us. As Mulder remarks when he tries to convince Scully that they're still in the hallucination, we can't simply appreciate or intellectualize our way out of our alienation from the structures we've created. It takes something much more drastic and yet undone, not relying on the strict behavioral encoding of tradition, nor that of capital and its exigencies for the individual to self-manage themselves through moralizing narratives. Be a professional. Don't be lazy. You're a responsible person, aren't you? You can find something to smile about in almost every situation if you're professional about it. Filling emotional needs is a major part of customer service. Rather, we would need to cultivate genuine communitarian bonds with one another. A very difficult task, Simple might it seem, since we've taken for granted that our structures will mediate that experience for us for so long now. Even subway stores have this problem. It's like building a ship. And the way you, you build a ship is everybody gets together and you build a ship and you learn how to do it by doing it. And the internet is this, this lure to tell people, hey, we'll teach you how to build a ship. But what you're actually learning is how to build a ship in a bottle. And then when it's time for everybody to get off the internet and come together, instead of having the corpus of knowledge to actually take some wood and build a ship, <clears throat> they've all just got their individual ship in a bottle, which mm -hmm. will get them precisely nowhere. And that's because the, the friction. Bauman had bemoaned the deadening of shared space through being transmuted into temples of commerce. But even these seem more communal than the atomized online shopping that dominates the market now. Silly as it might have been for the Brady Bunch to make an event of going to Sears, its mid-90s remake that poked fun at the idea, Put on your Sunday best, kids. We're going to Sears. is still several steps removed from the isolation of tapping on your phone to buy pants you can't try on and have them delivered by a poorly treated delivery worker whisking them to your door before the next day from some anonymous factory sorry, sorry, fulfillment center. They seem to think you are another machine. It only gets worse. <laughs> I'm afraid so. There's a way in which we pathetically long to be devoured. To have a job we hate and the burden of a mortgage. Three of my favorite things about the Tesla Model 3. I can watch Netflix. Because the pain of being metabolized is preferable to the sheer exposure 
of being vomited out into precarity. I can't handle it. So I hope I make it and I, my mom keeps saying I'm going to, but I feel like I'm not. And there's a way in which our inability to collectively exercise power and move forward with the active creation of our world has left us so dispossessed of it that this experience of recuperating value in old video stores and smelly carpeting is a method by which the relentlessly aggressive, all-consuming structure metabolizes us. What emerges from the fading social norms is naked, frightened, aggressive ego in search of love and help. In the search for itself and an affectionate sociality, it easily gets lost in the jungle of the self. Someone poking around in the fog of his or her own self is no longer capable of noticing that this isolation, this solitary confinement of the ego, is a mass sentence. The in-between is everywhere when everything is liquid. what you're looking for. I was fortunate enough to have lived next to this temple. It's called Hongmyeongsa, or the Temple of the Rainbow Dragon. If you sit in front of the waterfall when the light hits just right, you can often see a rainbow. I like to think that the rock behind it kind of looked like a dragon's claw and that it had somehow been encased in the rock, the tumbling water keeping it cool and assuaged from breaking out. It was my favorite temple in Korea. I used to sit on a cozy curve of a well-worn cliff just in front of the waterfall's refreshing lambent mist and try to meditate on the falling water. If you've ever done any meditation at all, there's a point at which you reach a level of focus unparalleled in the distractions of the world. You can't stay in that moment, but the service that a class of spiritual devotees provides to society is having a dedicated group stay in that intense liminal space between the hectic material world and the numinous hereafter. I don't have any firmly held beliefs in that regard, but it's worthwhile to recognize the value this has had for cultures throughout time and place. In the Buddhist tradition, Bardo is the liminal state after death and before rebirth. The Tibetan Book of the Dead is offered as a guide through this transitory period when one's corporeal form ceases to provide an anchor for consciousness. When someone dies the bardo total, the Tibetan Book of the Dead is read every day for 49 days. According to this text, the consciousness of the dead person lingers between one life and another for a period of 49 days. During that time, he is capable of hearing, so the text is read aloud to encourage and guide him. I mentioned in the last section that territories in a map become what they are through the lines drawn between them, and that we make sense of the world through such demarcation as well, through words, concepts, and distinctions. Returning to Marc Auger, he argues that monuments function to allow people to see themselves in a continuity of generations. Strangely, it is a set of breaks and discontinuities in space that express continuity in time. His career began with fieldwork in West Africa, where he noted that for the Akan people in present-day Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, the body is regarded as a space, one that can be invaded, one that is limited by vital centers and frontiers this centered body, he writes, is also the site of the convergence or meeting of ancestral elements, a meeting possessing monumental value, 
because it involves elements that existed before the ephemeral carnal envelope and will survive it. The golden stool only means money to the white man. They have searched and dug everywhere for it. I shall not pray one prejuan to the governor. If you, the chiefs of Ashanti, are going to behave like cowards and not fight, you should exchange your loincloths for my undergarment. The reason I think all of these spiritual considerations are important is that the world that is presented as practical and indeed more real derives that powerful ability to communicate this through its distinction with a world deemed religious, spiritual, or philosophical. Standing on the diagonal path of Columbus Street in San Francisco, I couldn't help but notice that the high and beautiful towers of the Saints Peter and Paul Church were dwarfed in size by the glass monuments of the financial district. Rejecting the traditional Weberian thesis that modernity had met the disenchantment of the world, Eugene McCare argues that it was more of a re-enchantment. The promise of sacrament for matter to be able to mediate the divine is done now less through the Eucharist and more through money. What McCarra terms pecuniary metaphysics imposes its spiritual form through its ontological rendering of matter as commodity or capital. But he, he compares the microchip uh, in, in one of his volumes to, uh, he compares it to the Eucharist. Yeah, I know. Which right. <laughs> is just is just insane on one level, but it's 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 par for the course if if you have uh, an enchanted capitalist metaphysic or or ethic. Quoting the management theorist Mary Parker Follett, McCarrer notes that providing more than commodities, profits, and paychecks, the corporation offered our greatest spiritual nourishment, a sacrament of life. Corporate managers and executives were the clarity of this moral and sacramental economy. And it's worth contrasting business offices to churches that are hosts to devotees wearing strange clothes they otherwise would not wear, conducting themselves in ways they wouldn't otherwise act, all in devotion to some transcendent, ethereal thing. Like the student debt that's preparing many of you to say two words, yes, boss, when your own exploitation can be recast as a project rather than a problem or an injustice, a source of fulfillment rather than an indignity, then solidarity with others can be vilified as conformism, the herd instinct of losers, the last refuge of mediocrities. There's an extent to which liminal space is the battleground whereupon the worlds at the limits is shaped. That people have begun to see non-places and the ensconced zones of their world as something worthy of notice speaks to this understanding that such value isn't merely a curated object for a museum or a professionally designed space or urban feature. It is part of our world replete with the infinity of the universe in every oil-stained patch of broken concrete and shuttered theater as much as in those things we're supposed to feel reverence for. One of the large transfer stations in Busan is beneath the Minam Rotary. It runs for several city blocks underground. It's very clean and sterile and often empty and plain, just stretching on and on with white tiles and echoes. But it also hosted these cool manga displays from local artists. These were webtoons or hobby creations existing perhaps otherwise only in the notebooks of some bored high school student. But they were awesome, and they represent a way of reclaiming what would have otherwise very much been a non-place. So too do these extraordinary examples of liminal art intercede in our mechanical way of merely going through the motions in that they give form to the strange and oft unarticulated spaces of our mental experience. And in so doing, they allow for rumination and some of the only scant remaining spaces for genuine reflection.
uh, about psychedelics. Well, what they're doing is, is forcing this maturation process by dissolving boundaries, which is what they do. They are exposing the cultural operating system for what it is, which is just a bunch of hacked together rules that evolved over time. Psychedelics in that sense spread alienation, but what they alienate us from is preposterous. The liminal experience is like the sacral. It promises connection between the mundane and the magnificent. In many ways, we are at a very liminal time in human civilization. No longer anchored to the comforting presuppositions of the Fordist state synthesis that ensures workers will make enough money to provide a market for the goods they produce, the world is passing on through a transition that will be shaped by the way those presuppositions met their limitations. Our structures have outpaced us in the way that Marx and Engels portrayed the capitalist as the sorcerer who is no longer able to control the powers of the netherworld he is called upon by his spells. As McCarra writes, a blindness to the enormity of reality has led to what William Blake had cautioned would be a Babylon builded in the waste. Each of us is participating as subject and object to this transformation. And thus, it's worthwhile to remember how Einstein had famously said that evil was good people letting bad things happen. And one of the ways of interpreting the mission this gives us is the task of obviating power. In his essay, The Heroes of Retreat, written just after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the German poet Hans Magnus Enzensberger contrasted the heroes of the past from those that will be necessary in the future. The place of the classic hero has been occupied in recent decades by other protagonists, in my opinion more important, heroes of a new style who do not represent triumph, conquest, victory, but resignation demolition, dismantling. The immense successes of the past have yielded a residual ancillary of vast and protean systems that undermine those successes and threaten to reverse them, leaving their inheritors with the task of carefully dismantling these systems while their entrenched interests in the world they had built armored them from critique and threatened to turn the world against itself for their preservation. Among the great challenges of this careful dismantling, he adds, the most difficult withdrawal of all is that of the war we've been waging since the Industrial Revolution against our own biosphere. Just as we can't exist in a liminal state forever, we can't constantly remain vigilant in keeping our structures from drifting onto a life of their own. Instead, the other side of this transitory experience lies in accepting our inevitable drift in between certainty and recognizing it not as cultivating a coping mechanism or a positive affect, but as building a strength to overcome some of our species' worst tendencies. Places aren't just what we make of them. They have a way of making us, obviously, so do most of our circumstances. But we have each other and breaking down the weird barriers we've inherited that keep us from one another is the only thing that is going to win this world back for us. Ooh. Under and out, out. Under and out. Damn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, close enough. Pay up, pay up. Uh, yeah, all right. Anyway, um, we wanted to give a huge shout out to uh, Robert Turka. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Give us a vowel, man. And Indranita, Guten Tag. Uh, you guys were the, the first ones to like watch all of our videos, leave some nice comments. Uh, we really appreciate it. And this comment from Zoe Jones, right, G Bong? I mean, shout oh, out, homie. Right, uh, right here. In his heart. In my heart. 
Thanks so much. Anyway, we both really appreciate uh, you know you guys getting something out of it. We put a lot of work into it, so thanks. And in the future, I should have some videos out uh, soonish. So check them out if you're interested in pursuing these kind of questions. That if you do, inevitably will cast off the warm blanket of ignorance you know as the thin veneer of certainty, never to be held beneath its warm embrace ever again. But if you need to pick me up, uh, Jibong here has an Insta where he posts positive stuff. What were you up to today, Jibong? I was frolicking in the colorful, effervescent bounty of springtime. It was beautiful. Well, that sounds lovely. Oh, and hey, I still have more subscribers than you, so, uh, hey up. <laughs> Anyway, to all of you who did check out the other video, subscribe, got something out of it, uh, you know, we really appreciate it, and we're just kind of talking into a computer screen. It's nice to know that there's someone on the other side who's maybe getting something out of it, so, yeah, makes it worthwhile. Thanks. We love you. Let's not blow that out of proportion or anything.